Hi everyone! Today I'm going to explain to you how to do the lab procedures for Lab 8 Day 2 and that's basically um, loading protein samples into a polyacrylamide gel, running the gel, dismantling the gel, and also putting the dismantled gel into a protein stain called Komasi Blue. So let's get started. So what I'm going to be following is the lab procedures that you probably already have in hand for Lab 8 Day 2. Um, and the procedures start off with first putting together six different protein samples. And in order to put them together to act as your recipes, in part one of the lab procedures, there's this table. Each column in the table describes the ingredients to add to each of the protein samples. So before we do that, let's talk about what the potential ingredients might be that you're going to put to make all of these protein samples. The first one, or the first two, are called purified GFP and purified BFP. And what that stands for is the GFP and BFP elution fractions that you should have saved the remainder of from last week's lab. So here they are. And if you recall, one of them should contain, the, the GFP one should contain the most GFP in it, and the BFP one should have contained the most BFP in it. So they represent purified GFP and purified BFP. The next two possible ingredients are called impure GFP and impure BFP. And what they represent, and they would be provided to you, the original protein mixtures that you isolated the GFP and BFP from. So if you recall, these mixtures contain not just GFP and BFP, but proteins larger than them and also proteins smaller than them. So those are the impure GFP and BFP samples. The next two possible ingredients, the first one is a solution of 50% glycerol, so that's this right here, and you're going to add this glycerol solution to any of the samples that you want to keep native, native meaning that you're not going to denature the proteins in those samples. The presence of glycerol will help to weigh these um, native samples down in the gel when you load them so they don't float out into the surrounding buffer. And then last but not least, there is this liquid and it's got a blue color. It's called protein denaturing solution. And this is the one that your lab procedures warned you about smelling like rotten eggs. And the reason why it smells like that is it contains a denaturing agent called beta mercaptoethanol that's meant to break um, disulfide or covalent bonds holding the shapes of your proteins together. It also contains SDS, and the blue color comes from a tracking dye that will help you follow your sample's progress once loaded and run in the polyacrylamide gel. So let's put these six samples together, and um, they're called, according to this table, G-boil, that means that you're gonna denature the proteins in that sample, G-nat, nat stands for native, meaning that you're not going to heat denature the proteins in that sample. Uh, B boil, B nat, IG boil, and IB boil. And the letter I stands for the word impure, meaning that these will contain samples of the protein mixtures, not the purified GFP and BFP. So according to this table, to make the protein sample called G boil, I have to put together two things into a microfuge tube. One would be 150 microliters of the purified GFP. The other would be 25 microliters of that stinky protein denaturing solution. So here we go. And you wanna change your tips every single time you pipette something with the micro pipetter to avoid cross-contaminating the samples with each other. So to make G-Boil, then I've labeled a tube, an empty microfuge tube as G-Boil. This is where my ingredients will go. I will put into it 150 microliters of the GFP elution fraction that I saved from the previous lab. And then with a new tip, I am going to measure out 25 microliters of the protein denaturing solution. And because it smells strongly, you wanna make sure that you keep this protein denaturing solution tube 
open for as little time as possible. And once you put the ingredients together, you just want to give the tube a little bit of a tap to kind of mix things around. And in case there's any splashing at all, feel free to balance these microfuge tubes into a centrifuge and give them a quick spin that just collects everything to the bottom. So pretending that we've pipetted the right amounts of everything into all six protein samples, what you are going to do next is boil the ones that you have on purpose named boil. I've prepared the six protein samples and I've given them a little spin in my micro centrifuge just to collect everything to the bottom of the tubes. Now I'm ready to boil only the ones that I've labeled as something boil. So that should be a total of four different microfuge tubes, which are the ones that I'm taking out of the centrifuge right now. There is a fifth tube that you also want to put into the boiling water bath. And that's something that should be provided to you it might be labeled as marker, and what it contains is a set of proteins of known molecular weights, and there's a little bit of tracking dye already added to them. You'll want to boil this marker tube, not adding anything to it, not taking anything out of it, along with your boil sample. So you should have a total of five tubes that you're putting into the boiling water bath. And if you recall from the last lab, in order to prevent them from exploding while boiling, you're going to apply to the tubes one of these reusable cap locks, which I will do right now. And as I do that, I will put it into a floaty like this one. That'll keep them from submerging in the boiling water. And then we will be ready to put this floaty in the boiling water bath for a total of five minutes. Once the five minutes are up, you're just gonna take them out of the boiling water and set them aside to cool to roughly room temperature. Now that the samples are prepared and the ones that are supposed to be boiled have been boiled and they're cooling right now, while I'm waiting for those boiled samples to cool, I'm going to get the polyacrylamide gel ready so that I can load my samples into them. So the polyacrylamide gel will probably come in plastic packaging that looks like this and it'll be sealed on all sides. Uh, the first thing you will want to do is open the package. So uh, easiest way to do that is to use a pair of scissors to cut along the top or the side. And then you're gonna pull the gel cassette out. This is what it looks like. And don't worry, there's gonna be liquid dripping off of it, but unlike what the lab procedures warned you about, it's not polyacrylamide that's dripping on you. It's a buffer that's meant to keep the gel moist. So the gel cassette looks something like this. It consists of a long plastic plate on one side and then the gel itself is very thin and it's the middle of the sandwich. The other side of the sandwich is a shorter plastic plate. And what you'll also see at the top, in this case it's green, is a comb that formed the sample wells as the gel was polymerizing. At the bottom, it's a little bit hard to see, but there's a green strip of tape. Both the comb and the green strip of tape have to be removed, and this is a little bit tricky because you have to wear gloves at all times to protect yourself from the gel itself. So to remove this comb, you'll notice on one side of the comb, there are two ridges and they're meant to fit my thumbs into them. And if I push along those ridges, it gives me a little bit of traction, allowing me to pull a comb out. And it's critical here that you pull the comb straight out instead of wiggling it back and forth to get it out. By pulling it straight out, you will be ensuring that the wells that are in the gel will stay straight on either side. All right, and then with my gloved hands, I would in reality remove the 
uh, small strip of tape that's at the bottom of the gel. The gel is not going to work unless you remove this tape from the bottom of it. So pretending that we remove this small strip of tape from the gel, we remove the comb by pulling it straight out of the gel cassette. Now you're ready to insert this cassette in the proper orientation in the electrophoresis chamber and it looks like this. Black stands for the cathode end of the gel. Red stands for the anode end of the gel. And they've, pretty ma they've made it pretty foolproof because on the inside of the electrophoresis chamber, there's just one slot to fit a single gel. The key for you is that you want to orient the gel cassette so that you can see the numbers and the black markings that are on the longer plastic plate. They should be facing you at all times. And with them facing you, you're just going to slide this cassette in its entirety into that little slot built into the electrophoresis chamber. What happens next before you do anything else for your safety is to remove the gloves that you are using to handle the gel cassette and its contents and switching out those gloves for a fresh pair. And once you have a fresh pair of gloves on, you're gonna pour into the electrophoresis chamber so that the gel is completely submerged, some of this electrophoresis buffer. This buffer contains some salts to help conduct the voltage that will be running through the gel. It also contains SDS, that detergent that you read about in the lab procedures, and that SDS will cause the buffer to form a little bit of foam as you pour it into the electrophoresis chamber. It doesn't matter where you pour this buffer in, your aim is to fill both sides of the gel and make sure they come up to the same level. So it doesn't matter where you pour it in, eventually you'll have to pour it into both sides of the gel. You also want to have enough buffer in there so that if you're looking at the gel head on, you can see all of the numbers and black markings on the gel cassette and you should see that those numbers are well below the level of the buffer. So a good guide is the short plastic plate in the back of the cassette, the buffer should actually be above that. And if you have it there, or a little bit more than that, you are probably good. So now that we have our gel ready to load, we're actually going to load our samples into it. And if you take a look at the front of the gel, which should be facing you, that's the longer of the two plates in the gel cassette. As I mentioned earlier, there's some black markings to show you where the 10 wells are located. Otherwise, you can't see them. And in this particular gel cassette, they're numbered for your convenience. So I'm going to load one of my samples into, just so you can see it a little bit better, into well number two. So the key to doing this is positioning your micropipetter tip properly. And I've set my micropipetter to deliver 20 microliters of sample. And I'm choosing on purpose the two to 20 microliter micropipetter. That's because the plunger comes up a little bit higher and that'll give you a little bit more control during the loading process. And again, you'll want to use a different micropipetter tip for each sample. So let's load a sample into well number two. So you want to position the tip, and this is the long plate of the gel cassette that's sticking out at me. You want to position the tip in back of this long plate, and you want to touch the back of the plate. Then you want to slide the tip down, keeping it angled towards you a little bit. And by doing it this way and positioning the tip that way, it ensures that the sample will go in between the two plastic plates of the gel cassette and your sample isn't instead running out into the surrounding buffer. So positioning my tip, touching the back of the long plastic plate of the gel cassette, I slide it down, keep it angled towards me, and now it's resting on the short plastic plate in the back of the cassette. Once I'm sure of that position, I also make sure that it's centered over well number two, according to the markings. And to release the sample, what you wanna do as slowly as you can is press the plunger of the micropipetter down in one smooth motion just to the first stop. Don't let go until you take the tip out, then let go and discard your tip. 
And what you may or may not be able to see, depending upon whether there's tracking dye in your sample, is that the sample itself is sitting in the well and it hasn't escaped into the surrounding buffer. And this will be much more challenging with your gnat samples that do not contain tracking dye in them. We've loaded all of the samples into the sample wells one by one, changing our tips every single time. So now we're ready to start the electrophoresis. And uh, the way you wanna do that is make sure first that your electrophoresis chamber is sort of close to the power source, which might look something like this. Um, you wanna put on the lid to the electrophoresis chamber. And basically what you wanna ensure is that you're matching the colors to each other. So the red lead should be on the red side, which stands for anode. The black lead should be matched up to the black side, which stands for the cathode end of the gel. And then you wanna match the colors before gently pressing evenly on both sides to make sure that the cover is properly seated at the top of the chamber. Once you are sure of that, you're ready to turn on the power source. And the power source has a power switch on one side of it. It's a little toggle switch. What you should see is that the voltage that we have selected, um, that's gonna be constant. So the light is next to the V on this display. The display itself is at zero volts right now. To change the voltage on this power source, I'm gonna use the plus and minus button. And if you hold it, it tends to go faster. And I'm gonna adjust the voltage to 125 volts. So before you start the voltage, you just wanna make sure that everything is in place. So cover is on, constant voltage, 125 volts. Once you're sure of that, you're ready to start the power source. And on this one, you would do that by pressing the running man button. And you'll notice the light above the running man will go on. You can also double check that it is running by looking back at your electrophoresis chamber. You'll notice at the bottom of the chamber, there's a wire and you can probably see little bubbles streaming up from that wire that lets you know for sure that the sample is running. And as it runs, any sample that you loaded into the gel that have blue tracking dye in it, you'll notice that the tracking dye at least is migrating down the gel towards the anode end of it. What we are waiting for is those samples with tracking dye to reach roughly three quarters of the way down the gel's length. So that may take anywhere from about 40 to 60 minutes total. Once it reaches that point, you're ready to stop the power. And if you look at the power source, there's a little hand and by pressing it, that'll stop the power for you. And then you're ready to go back to the toggle switch and power the entire thing off. I've turned off the power source to the electrophoresis chamber. So I, now I'm ready to take the gel out of the chamber. And I'm gonna do so by basically reversing everything I did to start it in the first place. So taking the lid off very carefully. And then with gloved hands, I'm gonna reach in and grab the long plastic plate of the gel cassette and just slide the whole cassette out. Now yours will have tracking dye uh, visible in the gel because you've already run your samples. This one is just meant to act as demonstration. Once I take the cassette out, it's gonna be dripping wet because of the electrophoresis uh, chamber that you removed it from. And then you'll wanna lay the cassette on some paper towels because it'll be wet uh, from that buffer. The next step will be to dismantle the gel cassette to extract the gel out between the two plastic plates and put the gel into the Komasi blue protein stain. So the easiest way to do that is use some kind of a device to pry the two plastic plates apart from each other. I'm choosing to use this metal spatula and the wider side will give me a little bit more area to work with. Um, in order to get the two plastic plates apart from each other, the best way to approach it is by using this spatula and sliding it in between the two plates along the sides. So you'll wanna slide it in between the two plates like so, and then holding it close to the edge, you'll wanna twist the spatula with a little bit of force either towards you or away from you 
to create a little bit of force um, to pry the two plastic plates apart. And if you do that successfully, you will hear a rather unpleasant sort of cracking sound that really lets you know that you're doing it properly. So I've already done that to this side. I'm just gonna continue on and finish up this side by prying the two plates apart from each other. I gave myself a little bit of a start. But that cracking sound is really what you're aiming for. And you wanna go all the way down the length if you can um, on either side. Once you've loosened both sides um, from each other, then you wanna pry the two plates apart from each other, kinda of like opening the cover of a book. So the easiest way to do that is grab with one gloved hand the long plastic plate, with the other hand the short plastic one, and then gently open the two plates apart from each other. And before you totally separate them, you'll wanna make sure that you understand, because this is the gel that you loaded and ran, you wanna make sure you understand and can locate the very first well that you loaded into. So for me, well number one was on this side of the gel. So for me, my first well was on this side of the gel, now that I flipped it over. And to give myself a little orientation mark before that small plastic plate that gets discarded and I lose my place, I'm gonna make a little notch by cutting a part of the gel off. And this is opposite of where the sample should be. So I'm gonna use the other side of my spatula because it's straighter, slice into this bottom corner closest to the first well that I loaded the gel in the first place and I'm gonna pull that corner off and that'll just be discarded as waste. Now the short plastic plate, which has done its job, can be dismantled from the long one and your gel will probably stay stuck to one of these two plates. In my case, it's the long one. Your next objective is to get this gel to peel off of this plate and into the Komasi blue stain. So the Komasi blue contains acetic acid and methanol, so it's gonna smell a little bit. So it's best to keep this container of stain closed until right before you're ready to work with it. So I'm gonna open the staining container. I'm gonna hold the long plastic plate gel side down over the container. And then using my spatula, and again, I choose to use the dull side because it might be a little bit gentler and it's also a little bit wider. Starting off on the, the bottom edge where I made the notch, I'm gonna slide the spatula in between the gel and the plate. And you can kind of see when you get that in between the gel and the plate. And then I'm just gonna slowly work my way inward. So what I'm pressing upon is the plastic plate and not the gel. That way I'm not gonna tear the gel into smaller pieces as I do this. And what you'll find is the more of it you loosen this way, the more likely gravity is going to eventually take over. So I'm gonna loosen it enough, kind of moving the spatula back and forth to keep on loosening it a little at a time and keeping the gel intact. Once I feel the gel like it is right now, start to roll off of the plate, I just let it go. And then you just wanna give it a little bit of a shake. And if you need to, with your gloved hands, kind of go in there and flatten that gel out. Make sure it's completely submerged before you cover it and let it stain for a few hours, if not overnight. Once that's done, the proteins that you couldn't see in the gel should be stained by the blue dye and the Komasi blue and either you your, or your instructor will extract the gel from the stain and take a photograph of it for you to analyze this data.